Welcome to the Passive Investing Show. I'm Ashley Wilson, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jay Scott. On today's episode, we talk to Pat Hyben and Tim Rode. Yeah, so Pat and Tim are two guys. Uh, they actually started GoBundance. For anybody that's been listening to our episodes over the last couple months, you're familiar with GoBundance. But today, we're talking not about GoBundance, not even about specifically passive investing. Today, we're talking about an amazing book that these two guys just released called The Quitter's Manifesto. Basically, this book is all about how to know when it's time to quit your job and move into the next phase of your life, hopefully retirement and passive investing, but not just when, how to do it, who to have there to help you and what you can be doing to create that safety net to ensure that when you leave your 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 full-time career and you transition into retirement and full-time investing, that you do it in the right way. And so just an amazing episode. These guys are filled with knowledge, filled with amazing sound bites. You're going to love this episode. So without any further ado, let's welcome Pat and Tim to the show. Tim and Pat, we are so excited to have you on the show. Can you start by telling us a little bit about yourselves and your background? Sure, I'll go first. Uh, My name's Tim Rode. Uh, Nowadays, I'm one of the founders of GoBundance and a nonprofit called One Life Fully Lived. But I started off really slow. Barely graduated high school, never went to college. And at 25, I was a part-time grocery clerk uh, doing side hustles, trying to make extra money. By 40, I had... uh, quit my day job, if you will, and uh, had just retired to just get the goods and ski uh, 100 days a year and do a lot of fun stuff. And I did that through passive investing. So I think this will be great for your show. Fantastic. How about you, Pat? Yeah. um, So I I'm a real estate agent uh, by history, let's say. I basically I went to college. I got a degree in sociology, um, got out, couldn't get a job um, in sociology. So I, I jumped into the path of the least barrier to entry, which was uh, getting a real estate license. I was a real estate agent, uh, had a brokerage, had a mortgage company, had a title company, had the whole nine yards um, for 25 plus years. Um, also got into investing in real estate, uh, did the monopoly game where you start out with little greenhouses and you build up to red hotels, uh, along with Tim and a couple other guys, we started a company called DAPT Acquisitions, which, uh, acquired apartment buildings. Now we have over 2000 doors, um, among other things, uh, uh, again, with Tim, started a company called GoBundance, which is a business mastermind, have over a thousand members. Uh, in between all of this, um, y- you know, had a bunch of failures of other things that didn't work out. But luckily, after I quit real estate, which I did in about 2010, 2011, um, I was able to, you know, pick up the ball again. And so that's where I am today. I live in South Carolina outside of Charleston and um, been married 30 years uh, and I have two grown daughters. Awesome. Love it. And uh, for any of our listeners out there, I'm sure you recognize GoBundance. We've actually spoken to uh, about a half dozen GoBundance members over the past couple months on all different topics. So love GoBundance. Um, You guys have a new book out. Um, it's called The Quitter's Manifesto, Quit the Job You Hate for the Work You Love. I'd love to talk a little bit about this book because I love the title. Uh, I'm going to admit I have not yet read the book. I apologize. Um, but the title and the and the tagline itself tells me, I think, everything I need to know about the book and the fact that I'm absolutely going to love it. Um, Pat, can you just walk us through a little bit about why you guys wrote the book and, and what the thesis of the book is? Yeah, absolutely. So what happened was um, basically the first day that I met Tim, I asked him what he did. And his answer was, I ski. And um, I was fascinated by that. And I had to learn more. And the long story short, Tim had retired at 40 years old um, through passive income in real estate. And he um, basically taught me how to do the same. He inspired me to quit selling real estate, to get out of the rat race that way and become more of an investor. I retired it uh, from that job or I quit that job at 46 years old. 
Um, and uh, one day during the pandemic, I, you know, was thinking about this great resignation and journaling on it and things. And I just called up Tim and I said, hey, we should write a book. You know, you were the mentee. You were the mentor. I was a mentee. Let's write a book about quitting your job. And through talking about it, we decided to create not an inspirational book, not a strategic book on you should, you know, we want everybody in the world to quit and come up with an idea and get on Shark Tank. Um, we wanted to make a tactical book. We wanted to make a book like if you've already decided to quit, right, and, and you should quit your job, this book is for you and this book is going to teach you how to do it step by step. We like in our book to uh, trapeze ring in a circus. So when you see the trapeze artists at the circus, you see that they have bars that they hold on to, and then they have a safety net underneath them. And we think this book is like how to build a safety net, your financial safety net, in case you do fall. And also what is each bar to grab onto as you're going across the trapeze. And each chapter is a different bar to grab onto. So it's a very much a how-to, very, very specific, very, very tactical book. And uh, it's done very well. And it seems the audience uh, uh, tends to like it. That's amazing. Um, I totally relate to everything you just said. And I think a lot of people are going to relate and and really gravitate towards what you're covering. Tim, is this something that you just came to an epiphany while working in the grocery job? When was it that you realize that there was a way out of the rat race? Well, it actually was uh, from when I was listing and selling real estate. So so um, I was a grocery clerk at 25. I finally found, actually, it was kind of like quitting the first thing to start the next thing, just like the book. But um, real estate was the first te- thing I ever did where I put the key in the lock and it you know what I mean? And so many can relate to that. But then what happened is about, you know, from 25 to 35, I'm selling real estate and it started to oxidize. What was so fun from 25, 26 to 34, it just started weather, weathering on me. And uh, I it took about four more years to actually quit and have that epiphany you mentioned, Ashley. I was in Belize and I was scuba diving and I was like just about to turn 40. And for the first time I stopped and looked around and said, I am so proud of you. You've actually done something. Look where you've been and look where you are. What do you want to do? And in my mind, it said, I never want to list another a blank, blank house again. And I said, whoa, just blew me away. So then Pat talked about tactical. What do you do at that point? You know, when it, when you're at the end of it and I wrote an amazing plan, it was called Tim is now an investor plan. And it's how I transitioned from going to listing and selling real estate to the next incarnation, which was just being my own best client and actually investing in real estate. I absolutely love that story, especially because I'm in the middle of reading The Gap and The Gain, and you are truly in the gain. You focused on the gain, and that's something I know as entrepreneurs, um, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to focus on where you've come from, all that you've accomplished. So hats off to you because that's just in- so super inspirational. That's awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. In the book, you guys talk about like what people should be doing when they get to the point, when they get to the, I think you refer to it as the cliff, um, to, to make that decision of how to move forward. Um, Pat, can you talk to us a little bit about that um, when, you, when you're trying to decide um, like is now the time or, or when is the time? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so first of all, we want people to realize that quitting is scary. Right. You need to come to the conclusion that it is scary. And it's good that it's scary because if you're lackadaisical and not scared when you quit, you might not do as good of a job at whatever you do next. Right. If you're going to build something, you might 
you know, be slow about that. We want you to be scared and we want you to move forward on, on your next plan of life. But I think a lot of people are in denial that it is scary. They don't know why they haven't quit yet. And the real reason they haven't quit yet is because they're scared. So we wrote the book so that you wouldn't be as scared, right? So that when you look over the cliff, it's like, yeah, that's a cliff, but there's a safety net and there's some trapeze bars. Now, the question lies is, you know, how do I know if I really should quit? And that's where we created something called the Soul Sucking Audit. And the Soul Sucking Audit is a, is a series of questions that has you go through different categories. And if you score six or less on these categories, then you, then, then you, you know, you basically, uh, it's time for you to quit. Um, and, uh, Tim, you want to talk about what the, uh, what the five things are for the soul sucking audit? Sure. It's a, it's a metric that you can do with yourself to realize how much does this actually suck versus how ready am I to quit? And this was what was going through in my mind in the, when I was in my 30s. And that uh, metro is five things. Number one, your compensation. Are you being well compensated for what you do? Number two, the respect you get from the re organization. Uh, how well do they um, treat you? Number two, three, uh, the fit within within you and the organization. How well do you fit in with the team? Number four, your personally personal ability to grow within that team. And, and number five, most important, is how do you feel every day when you wake up? <laughs> do you want to go to work? Are you excited? Or I, I use the word oxidize or rust. And, and from 25 to 34, I love selling real estate. And all of a sudden, I didn't. And, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this. So yeah, I think that's a huge piece of this is, is the soul sucking audit. I think this is incredible, especially because Jay and I are actually in the process of hiring and we have gone through these five categories, unbeknownst um, to us that this is what you're, you know, having people gauge as to whether or not they should quit. These are categories that are extremely important to us to create um, a really good environment for people to join our team. So it's right on point with, you know, what people are thinking about when considering not only taking a job, but staying with a job. So I think that is, uh, you know, hitting the nail on the head. And it's something that I considered when I left, I used to work in big pharma. And it's something that I considered when I left, I went through all of these items. And that's ultimately why I resigned. Those are the reasons why most people resign and leave. So it's important to take control. So what would you say the next step is after someone realizes they've come and they've, you know, speaking of going like a trapeze artist, and now you've identified that this is not the right situation for you to continue your life journey, what is the next step? We, um, we recommend that one of the first things you do is you, is you build a quit team. And a quit team uh, consists of four different things. And we, we outline it in the book. We actually have a little graph that you could fill in the, the blanks on all the quit team. The first on it is your stakeholders. Now, a stakeholder, and sometimes a stakeholder is the hardest one for some people. A stakeholder is going to be like your spouse, right? It's going to be someone that's like, Ashley, I'm with you. This is a great idea. You should do it, right? Someone that believes in you. Um, two or three people, ideally, that believe in you. Um, the the next category is partners, and that is like um, people that if you do well, they do well. So let's say you're going to open up. Let's say you're going to be a real estate agent. The easiest one is like a mortgage officer, a couple of mortgage officers, a title company rep. Um, you know, people that if you do better, they do better. Anybody that's a vendor of your new business or whatever you're going to do that's going to do better um, with you, that's kind of your partner. And it could be an actual partner. It could be a business partner. But think of it that way. And you need like two or three of those. 
Okay. And then the next one is going to be a mentor. Now, a mentor is not what a lot of people think. A lot of people think a mentor is like this person that's sitting underneath the oak tree at the top of a hill with a long white beard, giving you advice on all kinds of different things, meditating all the time. A mentor is actually someone in your specific new business or new job that has proven themselves, that, that has experience. So let's say you are opening a independent Exxon gas station. This would be someone who's had one for several years, who successfully runs it, um, who could give you specific tactical advice like, you know, put these cigarettes here and put this chewing tobacco here because it sells more uh, when people see it and there's more profit here. Like very, very specific advice. And that's going to be your mentor. And then the last person is going to be your coach. And your coach is more like someone who's keeping you accountable to doing daily goals. Not like big goals, like, oh, I want to make a million dollars, but like daily goals. Like, um, let's say you open up a pizza place or, or, or something, right? Your daily goal would be to visit, you know, five local schools and sponsor the PTA or the blood drive or whatever and, and, and get them to buy the pizzas from you or whatever it is that's going to grow your pizza business uh, specifically that day. Like where you would ask, what did I do today to make money? Um, that would be your coach keeping you accountable to that. And you write down a couple of names for that and you put it all together and that's a quit team. And if you have a good solid quit team, chances are you're going to make it. I, I absolutely love that. And I think part of the problem that so many of us have, um, I, I remember uh, my wife and I, we kind of semi-retired back in 2008 um, from our tech jobs. And, um, and for us, it was really difficult because we felt like, we were going from this support system. We had all these colleagues. We had uh, people we had worked with for decades. We had all these people around us to suddenly we felt like we were completely alone. Um, and so what I hear you guys saying is it's just the opposite. Um, instead of going from a support network to being alone, you need to go from a support network to building a, just a brand new support network, a bunch of people um, that have specific roles to play to help you grow and learn and basically get ready to tackle not retirement. I know we talk, we talk about it being retirement, but it's actually the next phase of your life. And there's just as much active participation in retirement as there is when you're working. It's just a different type of, of, of participation and you need a different type of people and a different group of people around you. And I love the way you broke it down um, between um, uh, your, your stakeholders, which are obviously the people that are like intimately involved in this with you, your partners, the people that you can rely on and that you can help and that can help you. And then your mentor and coach, which I, I, I love the fact that you've broken it into those two different things. Too many people, I think, think of mentors and coaches as the same thing. Um, but they're not. And so I, I love the fact that you've, you've kind of broken it down. Pat, I know that uh, when, when you, you mentioned earlier that Tim was kind of part of your quit team when you left. What role would you say he played for you? And can you talk a little bit about specifically um, how he, as part of your quit team, was able to help you succeed? Yeah, that, that's a cool question. No one's asked that one before. But I think that – I think by that time he was – a little bit of a stakeholder because we were good friends. Um, and um, also he was a partner because what, what happened was uh, we opened up DAPT acquisitions and we started go abundance. So like he was invested in, in my job, whether he knew it or not, he was invested in my, my new ventures uh, doing well, right? Because we d we're doing them together. Like if I had gone back, and started selling real estate again, it wouldn't have been in his best interest because it would be taking my time away from our new ventures. That's a great question though. Tim, I just want to switch gears just a little bit here and ask you, um, what do you do with your finances? You're, you're making a huge dramatic change in your life. How do you prepare your finances? How do you prepare yourself for setting up to quit and then the future? 
Pat touched on it. The, the, it is the safety net. As you're going across those trapeze bars, you have to have the finances as a huge piece of this. And uh, so we have things that uh, four things we suggest you do. Number one, get real. So many people are not, quote, real with their finances. They don't stop and look, you know, the whole picture, what's coming in, uh, what's my burn rate, and what's left to invest and, and, and to live on. So I think it's really important to know those numbers, no matter where you are in life, actually. But especially when you're going to make a big move, it's really important to take a step back and look at the whole picture. So number one is get real. Number two is um, get credit. While you still have a job and you're able to get credit, uh, you know, get a get a line of credit against your house, get some extra credit cards, um, and make sure that you have the funds necessary to get you across that big chasm you're about to cross to go from here to there. And number three is to have an emergency fund to make sure when. Uh, things kind of go sideways on you that you're able to withstand all the things that are going to come your way. So once again, get real, get credit, and get an emergency fund that help you through all of this. So that's it, Ashley. Excellent. Well, now we're at the part of the show where we ask all of our guests, the same three questions. So we are going to ask the two of you um, these three questions. You can either go back and forth or you can both answer them together. We're honestly interested in hearing from you both. So if, if you wouldn't mind sharing your answers, that would be great. Um, the first question is, what new thing have you recently invested in or are currently researching? Tim and I, Tim and I have a bet right now. Um, we're trying to each save a million dollars cash just because we want to be um, not investing. Uh, uh, you, you might not like that answer, but what our goal is, is just, you know, we, we both of us are addicted to investing. And in the past, <clears throat> it was very difficult for us to even have a hundred grand saved up because um, – because there was always an investment to do and there was always something to put your money into and you were always moving forward on investments. And we really starting to feel like, mm, you know, we're getting ready to have a, a crash. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And, and, and who can get to just have a million dollars cash and not spend it? Um, so, you know, what are we researching? We're really researching like what to sell, not what to buy. And I know that's probably not what you want to hear. No, I, I love that. Um, I mean, I, I'm one of those people that you, you hear about people that are really bad with money and we talk about, it's like they have a hole in their pocket. The minute they get a, a dollar, that dollar is gone. I'm one of those people. I've just been really good at ensuring that when that dollar goes out, it doesn't go to buy something frivolous. It goes to a, an investment. And so I'm the same exact way. If, if I sell something and I get 100K in my, in my bank account, First thing I do is I don't think, great, I've got 100K saved up. I think, okay, I need to spend this 100K. I need to invest this 100K. Give me another investment. And so uh, this this idea of being able to, to keep a million dollars in your bank account and not invest it, um, I, one, I think it's great. But two, that's really hard to do for people like us. We're deal junkies. And it was also hard for us to have an emergency fund while we were quitting because we're just so like you, Jay, wanting to do the next thing. So, Yeah, I actually have a question about this because this is very intriguing. First of all, I like the fact that the two of you are in competition on saving a million dollars. That in and of itself speaks to having a good network and surrounding yourselves with people that are like-minded. So that'll keep you on track, hold you accountable. But the other question I have is more of a challenge question. And if a listener is listening because if I was listening right now, I would say to myself, why choose now in such a high inflationary market to have idle money? So I'm just wondering what your thought is as to why have the competition now on saving a million as opposed to putting that money to work. I got a friend, he was the duplex king of Sacramento in 2007. And in 2009, he was bankrupt. 
And, and I would rather in these inflationary time, leave a little on the table. You know, right now we're kind of, let's say like this, we don't know what's going to happen. And if it, and it, and when things went a little bit down, he bet it was going to go back up and he was wrong. And he, and he lost. I'm not talking, you know, little, little paltry amount. He was worth over $20 million and BK. So, I mean, he bet big. And we, and we know a lot of people like that. And it seems like now that people are, are, are leveraging, you know, more than ever, um, they're throwing returns out the window in order to, only look at what their tax benefit is. Um, it's, it's, it's just, there's some silly stuff happening. Tim, Tim and I have just been around too much. They say, they say smart money is just dumb money uh, that's been through a correction. And, and, and we've been through a couple of corrections. And so, you know, uh, we don't know if we're right or wrong, but we just sold a shopping center. We just sold a big apartment building that we have. We're going to take the cash. We're going to pay taxes on it. We're not going to 1031 it and try to fit a square peg in a round hole. Um, you, you know, I, I, I sold some crypto. I'm, 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 I'm chipping off a bunch of, of stocks. I've sold two single family homes that just, we're like, you know, near busy roads, just things that in a bad market wouldn't sell as well. And the only reason they sell in a good market is because people don't, people tend to forget about the busy road being next to it or whatever. So it's just, um, it's just in our opinion, uh, you know, that equation, that whole equation of trying to beat inflation by one or two percent, it's all, it's all a pro forma that people are pulling out of their butt. Nobody knows, right? Every deal you look at is just somebody's pro forma, somebody's complete guess of what may happen. Love that. And and I mean, Ashley and I often talk about the fact that heading into a, a recessionary period, um, anything you don't want to hold for the next five years, might as well just get rid of now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's better to lose five, seven, eight, nine percent to inflation um, than lose 20 or 30 percent or 50 percent or 100 percent to a bad deal. So certainly get that. Love that. Um, jumping into the second question that we like to ask, um, what is the what are you most concerned about right now in terms of either economic situation or um, legislation um, in terms of impact that it could have negative impact that it could have on your investments? I, you know what? I'd say all of it. And that's why we're doing the race to a million. You know, we see maybe there's better times ahead and we're going to wait for that. And right now, wise people just take a step back and observe if you can. You know what I mean? Some people have to keep on pushing it. And, uh, you know, I, that, that makes it tough. But when you, when you, if you've got the means right now to just take a step back and, and observe, that's what, uh, people who have been uh, through a few of these are, are actually doing. So that's my thought. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, yeah, like Tim said, it's, it's a lot of things. People are going to eventually start wanting their money back. And by that, I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Jenga. You know, you play Jenga and you pull out the little thing. Well, in the past two years with the stimulus money, everybody took those little blocks and put them all together uh, with all this extra money. And people are going to start wanting their 50 grand that they put into this syndication back. And they're going to they're gonna say, well, I'll take 25 for it. Uh, I just got a letter the other day on an investment. Tim and I did uh, where the guys like just literally like eight months ago, we did the investment and, 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 and the guys – like sending letters to everybody else that invested, like, hey, I'm willing to sell at a significant discount. Do you do you want to buy my portion? You know, so I think if people are going to start pulling out those little Jenga blocks slowly but surely, you know, or the these deals are going to um, not do as good as as the person thinks, as the general partner thinks, and they're going to issue a capital call. And the people are going to be like, I'm not putting good money after bad. Um, uh, or, you know, so just 
take me out of it or, or whatever, or, or stop returning their emails or what have you. So I, I just think you're going to start seeing some of that. Again, I hope I'm wrong and I could be extremely wrong and I've been wrong before. So. And this brings us to our third question, which I'm really excited about because you both have such good sound bites during this interview. But our last question is, what is the best piece of advice? It can be investing advice or just general advice that you have ever received. It's a, it's a page in our book. And, and uh, we call it the I over O a quotient. And it's interest over obligation. And uh, it was a guy named, uh, Rafa, uh, let me get it right, Naval R- Ravikant, okay? And that's who it's from. You're welcome, Pat. And uh, he came up with this theory. It's spending as much time as you can in interest over obligation. And so many people are on that hamster wheel and they don't know how to get off and they, and they don't know what to do, but they'd love to do what, what interests them over what they have to do. And, and knowing what your I over O quotient is, how much of your time is spent in interest over obligation. And I think that's one of the most brilliant things. And candidly, when I read, when I first heard it, it was like, I've been doing that for the last 25 years. And, and I didn't realize it, but I think it's such a huge piece for people to want to get to. And then the thought process becomes, well, what do I want to do? And, and when you can, you know, get quiet for me, it's getting on a mountain and thinking about, I want to do this more. How can I make that happen? And it makes you actually more productive in the things that you have to do to get to what you want to do. That's my thoughts. That's a good one. That That is a really good one. And we love talking about that in our book. And uh, so Tim's a huge Naval fan now. Uh, after 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 we plagiarized him for a while uh, on a couple other <laughs> podcasts. So, um, I'm, I'm a huge Naval fan as well. For those out there who don't know, he's actually the former uh, CEO of AngelList, which is uh, an angel investing uh, website. So brilliant guy. Pat, any, anything to add there in terms of, of great advice? You know, um, I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're at a time now where there's a lot of, that kind of goes to your question, Jay, about like what could possibly happen and is what can we be scared of? And I think as we go through all this, um, uh, you know, we just have to be, we just have to be calmer about it. Like, uh, I, you know, I once heard a guy say, uh, the calm, serene man is always loved and revered. And I think that's, that's true. It's Tim and I have a joke, uh, that we, whenever one of the other ones, you know, upset about one thing, the, the, the other one of us goes, eh, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, it comes from a Sarah Silverman skit, but, um, you know, it's kind of the, the, the thing of it's so true. You know, if you just say to yourself, eh, what are you going to do? You know, because we're out of control. Like there's just about everything we do that we have, we don't have as much control as we really think we do. So you just have to kind of eh, stay calm. Love it. Awesome. Okay. For our listeners who want to learn more about you guys, um, get in contact with you guys, or most importantly, want to buy the book, The Quitter's Manifesto, uh, where can they find the book and how can they find out and get in touch with you guys? The, the book is everywhere. So you can just Google it. It's, uh, you know, Amazon, Bigger Pockets is the publisher. Uh, you could go to their website and there's a bunch of free gifts. We also have, um, we also have some coaching that we're doing uh, that you could that you could get more information on. We offer a free playbook that's like a companion guide to to the book, and and we put it all on one website. Uh, all you need to remember is uh, quittersmanifestobook.com. That's quittersmanifestobook.com. Uh, there's a little you know reach out to me uh, page if you want to reach out to Tim and I. Information on the coaching, information on the book, information on other books we've uh, written, things like that. Everything's there. Quittersmanifestobook.com. Awesome. Anything to add there, Tim? Pat nailed it. 
I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Everybody go to Amazon.com right now or biggerpockets.com slash store to get to the Bigger Pockets store and check out all the great books there and pick up a copy of the Quitters Manifesto. Ashley, you want to take us out? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Tim and Pat, for joining us today. We have thoroughly enjoyed this episode. If you want to check out more on Pat and Tim, please make sure to go to quittersmanifestobook.com. Make sure you also purchase the book there, and that's where you can get in touch with both Tim and Pat. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to like, subscribe, and share both on YouTube and your favorite podcast platform. We hope today's episode has had a good impact in having your money work hard for you. 